Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. I am delighted to uh, welcome you to what is our last for this academic year launching leadership conversation. So thanks very much for being here. I, um, we always begin our program with the land acknowledgement, so we'll start with that. Mount Holyoke College begins each event in the life of the college by acknowledging that those of us in Western Massachusetts are occupying the ancestral land of the Nanatuck people. We also acknowledge the neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohegan to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. We encourage every member of our community to learn about the original inhabitants of the land where they reside. The impact of settler colonization contributed to the displacement, removal, and attempted genocide of indigenous peoples. This land acknowledgement seeks to verbalize Mount Holyoke's commitment to engage in shared responsibility as part of our collective humanity. We urge everyone to participate in action steps identified by indigenous community-based organizations. And now I'm pleased, as I said, to welcome our special guest. I'll tell you about her in just a minute, but I want to say that um, our special guest has some special guests. So <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the family of Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin Lambert, class of 2009, is here, <laughs> joined by her parents and her partner. So we want to say a special welcome to you all as well. Thank you. So let me start by saying that um, Caitlin is one of four Mary Lyon Award winners selected by the Alumni Association. That award is going to be given tomorrow. Uh, and I'm so pleased that she's on campus today so that we could have this conversation. These conversations are really intended to highlight the career journeys or paths of our graduates, recognizing that those paths are not always straight. Sometimes <laughs> they zigzag, you know, we'll hear about Caitlin's journey in just a minute, it's pretty exciting. But it's always interesting and inspiring to see how the intellectual adventures of a Mount Holyoke education have been the catalyst for these exciting career journeys. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Caitlin. Caitlin Lambert, class of 2009, is the executive director and co-founder of the Children's Legal Defense Center, a nonprofit legal assistance organization in Hargeisa, Somaliland. She defends wrongfully imprisoned children. Um, Caitlin previously served as a legal officer and advisor for the Horizon Institute, developing and managing a criminal justice paralegal program that provided legal assistance to more than 3,000 detainees in Somaliland. She earned a JD from Villanova University and a master's degree in international human rights law from the University of Oxford. Before all of that, she was a Mount Holyoke student majoring in critical social thought. So, of course, my first question is this. How did you get from South Hadley <laughs> to Somaliland uh, in terms of your journey? Tell us a little bit about that. Great. Um, thanks, President Tatum. And I just want to say it's really a pleasure to be back at Mount Holyoke. It's been quite a while since I've been here, so I'm really thrilled to be back um, because it, for me, um, was a really critical time in my life, um, both personally and obviously professionally. Um, so now, as Pe President Tatum said, I'm in Somaliland, which is an autonomous region of Somalia. Um, grew up in rural Pennsylvania, came to South Hadley, and yeah, it's a big question, how did <laughs> I get there? Um, and being here at Mount Holyoke was a, was a really big part of that. Um, of course, intellectually, right? As you know, um, some of the best education you can get anywhere in the world. Um, but, in, you know, I don't want to sound corny, but because of the inspiration of being here, um, I, you know, get down like everyone does, and sometimes I need a good quote, and a lot of times I turn to Mary Lyon, you know, go where no one else will go, do what no one else will do. And that's really, you know, the spirit of Mount Holyoke that mm -hmm. got me to Somaliland. 
Um, and in particular, you know, I was really lucky um, to be here at a time where at least I think there were some pretty amazing professors. I'm positive there are amazing professors now, but I'm a little biased. Um, and one of the professors who is still here now that I had the opportunity to study with, but who was also one of my advisors on critical social thought, Mary Renda, I was at uh, an advisory session and she said, you know, Caitlin, when you graduate from Mount Holyoke, you just need to have one big idea. That's it, just one big idea. I'm pretty sure at the time I was stressing out about something <laughs> um, and getting really nervous about graduating in 2009 and there's an economic recession and oh my goodness, what am I gonna do? Um, but that was really powerful to me to have, okay, it can be as simple as one big idea. And another really important moment that I had at Mount Holyoke was um, studying uh, the Rwandan genocide. And it was the first thing that I read about that really didn't feel like homework. Um, and so that was my one big idea, I'm gonna go to Rwanda. Um, and so there was a small sidestep to Ohio for a year where I was in AmeriCorps Vista and getting some skills. Um, and then I got on a plane and I went to Rwanda. Um, and I'm not sure I would have had the confidence um, to do that without, um, yeah, being in this environment for four years and having my confidence uh, nurtured and inspired by, you know, all the great professors we have access to, all the strong women that we get to see, all the other strong leaders um, that we get to witness. And so another thing that Mount Holyoke helped me was with the can-do um, attitude. And so I was in Rwanda I knew I wanted to do human rights research. I heard of a human rights researcher that was running a small nonprofit, and I emailed her until she met with me. <laughs> <laughs> As in uh, multiple emails. Yes, multiple <laughs> emails. Persistence um, is a key to life, I think, in general, but mm -hmm. definitely to getting to where you want to be. Um, and I really wanted to work with her. And finally she met with me, and she hired me, and. Um, it was an amazing year of talking to survivors of the Rwandan genocide, collecting their stories, but also talking to perpetrators um, and, you know, helping her write reports and, yeah, really documenting this historical event that so transformed the world and so transformed the field of human rights. Um, and from that experience, I knew, okay, I really have some skills from Mount Holyoke, writing, reading, speaking but I wanna have something a bit more. And so I went to law school. And then when I was getting ready to graduate from law school, the same person I worked for in Rwanda was starting a justice project in Somaliland. And she said, what are you doing after graduation? And I said, oh, I don't know, I'm struggling this and that. And she said, come to Somaliland for six months. And so I did that. Um, and it was only supposed to be for six months, but uh, that's kind of how life goes sometimes. You get there and the issues were so engrossing. Um, you know, it wasn't high level human rights, it's really down in the trenches. Um, working in the legal system in Somaliland, which is really underdeveloped and, you know, questioning how do we promote human rights in this type of environment? Um, and I'm still there since 2015. Um, eight years later. Eight years later, <laughs> yeah. Um, it was only supposed to be for six months, but eight years later, and yeah, I think a lot of it is, it wasn't the straightforward path. It was not the straightforward path from out of law school either. Um, all my friends in law school did not do what I did. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure I would have had the confidence to take that leap if it wasn't for coming to Mount Holyoke and yeah, getting inspired here. So, you know, in your bio it says you did law school, but then also there is this degree from international human rights law yeah. from the University of Oxford. Yeah. So when did that happen? Um, I went to Oxford, so it's a degree from Oxford that is set up to, um, for students who are also working. So it's meant to uh, take people who are in different fields um, where human rights are an issue and give them an opportunity to do a master's degree. So it was in 2015. 16 and 2017. So while you were while, in Somaliland. While I was in Somaliland, yeah, I yeah. was writing an 
essay on universal jurisdiction in Somaliland while I was also doing other things. So, um, but it was brilliant because I could think of these really high level issues, right? What are universal human rights? What is you know, universal jurisdiction? But really also be in the trenches and say, okay, how do we apply these lessons to people's everyday lives? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so, I, so for the b benefit of the audience, um, I've had a chance, of course, to talk a little bit to Caitlin. So I know the answer to the question I'm about <laughs> to ask. But I think it's important for um, our audience to know more about exactly what you're doing yep. in Somaliland. So yep. it's about juvenile justice, but what does that mean in the context of Somaliland? Yeah, so Somaliland um, is, as I mentioned before, an autonomous state in Somalia. Um, and because it's an autonomous state, it functions like its own country. And so it has a legal system. And it was a British protectorate, so it has a largely British um, legal system. But it's one of the most underdeveloped areas of the world. Um, they had a very uh, brutal civil war in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, so they you know, really struggled with education and yeah, basically everything about development of um, a country. And so when I went there, um, you know, a lot of, and this is what we were doing in the beginning when I, in 2015, when I got to Somaliland, people are talking, thinking about these issues in a really high level, right? The United Nations is there. They're thinking, what structures do we need to put in place? What policies do we need to put in place? But no one is talking about how to actually do the work and how to implement these rights uh, for children in particular. But so through my work, we were getting closer and closer to the people, closer and closer to the issues, working in prisons. Um, and one of the benefits in Somaliland, there is a pretty strong legal framework. Um, there is a juvenile justice law that implements international human rights um, and makes it local law. And so in 2020, one of my colleagues and I said, wait, but there's still a lot of juveniles in prison who shouldn't be here um, for a variety of reasons. And we're lawyers, we have something we can do with this. Um, and so we started you know, doing courtroom advocacy, just like you would think about it in the US. And that in the Somaliland context is pretty radical. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, we're doing criminal justice, but at the end of the day, we're also doing human rights, right? So because it's a law in Somaliland to be imprisoned as a last resort as a child, we can go into courtroom and litigate that. Um, and either get children released or get their prison sentences reduced. So what we say that we're doing is uh, putting human rights in action, right? Because I think that's <coughs> right now on my journey where I've gotten to, right? Mm -hmm. Where a lot of what we think of human rights can be policy, um, more high level, but at the end of the day, if it's not changing people's <coughs> lives, then it's um, not very helpful. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing at CLDC. We're, we're trying to you know, provide legal aid to children who can't per, you know, afford lawyers, which is, which is most people in the criminal justice system in Somaliland. Um, and we're implementing human rights in the process. Yeah. So when you first arrived in Somaliland, I'm imagining, did you say to yourself, what am I doing here? I mean, <laughs> you know, when you describe it as yeah. a place that is still so underdeveloped. Um, yeah, I think um, it was a big shock going to Somaliland, um, especially as a woman. So it's a Muslim majority society. And so when I'm there, I have to cover. I wear my hair in a very nice turban um, and wear long dresses. And so for me, I had been to other parts of Africa um, that were also underdeveloped, but being in a society that is so drastically different than my own, um, and especially as a woman in a traditional society and what that entails, um, but also trying to affect change in the society. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a big challenge. Um, you know, there's, you're trying to struggle with work and try to figure out what you're doing with work and, you know, get all the normal work things done. But at the same time, you're trying to learn, okay, how do I exist 
um, in this environment and how do I make an impact in this environment while also taking care of myself? Mm -hmm. um, which is not always a straightforward answer in Somaliland, mm -hmm. um, but it's been an exciting journey. Yes. So. so there's a question that I ask everyone yeah. who is part of my series here, this Launching Leadership series, and it has to do with what it means to be authentically bold. <laughs> I made reference to, um, uh, I read an interview by Sheila Marcello, mm -hmm. who is a Mount Holyoke alum, very mm -hmm. successful entrepreneur. And she talked about how when she first started her company, which some of you may have heard of, it's called care.com. Mm. Um, and she started that company and no longer runs it, she sold it. But yeah. um, when she got started, she had this idea that people needed help finding caregivers yeah. for their children, for their elderly parents. And she would go to see people who might invest in her company. And most of those people were men and they often uh, maybe wondered, you know, what are you doing here and what do you know? And, you know, she had to assert herself in a kind yeah. of way. And she said she learned to assert herself with authentic boldness. And I love her definition of that. She says, when you bring your truest self to the table, mm. you are able to be bold in your own authenticity. Mm. And I think there's a lot of evidence at listening to your story. There's a lot of boldness in it, right? Um, and so my question to you is, how did your Mount Holyoke experience really help you find or deepen that sense of authentic boldness? Yeah, um, that's a great, great question. Um, and I think in three ways. Mm -hmm. But the first way is another Professor Mary Renda story, Gender Studies 101, my first semester. She took us out to Mary Lyon's grave and she told us to take up space. Uh -huh. And literally we had to do this in the middle of campus. And, you know, as an 18 year old, that was, ha, huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I want to be in the middle of campus doing this around all my peers. But it was really an inspiring lesson that it is okay to take up space, whether that's intellectually or physically, mm. right? And, and I think that's a lesson that I've carried through my whole life so far, right? Um, right now in Somaliland, it is most of the time males, right? It's mm -hmm. a very traditional society. Um, and so I have to be confident in myself to take up space in, in that environment. So that was a really strong lesson here right off the bat um, within my first couple of weeks uh, doing that. And that's really stuck, stuck with me, um, that I shouldn't be afraid to take up space. The other lesson that I learned here is to interrogate my own ideas. Um, so I grew up in rural Pennsylvania um, in a fairly traditional um, environment, I would never trade my childhood for anything. It was wonderful. Um, but my mom, who is here today, she saved some of my high school things. Um, and I had this English teacher who had us write down 18 things we fiercely believe in. And that, I think, was my junior year of high school. And I've read that recently, and I was like, wow. Horrified. <laughs> wow. Uh, wow, how interesting. I mean, we're all products of our environment. Um, but I think one thing that's really unique about Mount Holyoke is it's a safe space to really question, well, why do I think that? Where is that idea coming from? Um, and I think that's something that is really important, um, has been important throughout my whole career, right? So when you think about advancing human rights, well, why do I think that that is a good thing to do in this context? Mm -hmm. Why am I, as a, someone who identifies as a white female, going to an African country to advance human rights? Right? How do I do that in a way that is not just about me, that empowers everyone that I'm working with? Right? So I think, you know, for me, being authentically bold, it's also being self-aware. <laughs> of where I come from, where my ideas come from, hearing um, other people's ideas. Like my co-founder Idris, um, he has really influenced me a lot. He's a Somalilander, 
He's born in Somaliland, trained as a lawyer in Somaliland, and in Somaliland they have three types of law. They have statutory law, like we would think about, right? They have Sharia law, and they have customary law, right? Um, and that customary law is through the clans, right? It's informal law. And I thought flying in as a US trained lawyer, duh, it, no good, no good. We can't have that. We have to, if we're going to develop Somaliland, we have to be, you know, formalized law. He has changed my ideas radically. We use customary law all the time to keep kids out of jail. Um, so I think it's being aware of yourself and questioning your own ideas is one thing that I really learned here. But the last thing I would add to be authentically bold, another thing I learned at Mount Holyoke is trusting my own ideas. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say I was very confident academically when I came here or, you know, confident in what I had to say. Um, but over the four years I was here, yeah, that was really nurtured. And similar to, you know, the example of the alum that you gave going in to look for funders and having, you know, male faces looking back, like, why are you here? You really have to trust yourself. Um, you know, I really had to trust myself when I got on the plane to Rwanda. I really had to trust myself when I got on the plane to Somaliland. Um, and I really had to trust myself when um, we decided to set up the Children's Legal Defense Center. So it's myself and Idris, who's a Somaliland lawyer, but I'm the one responsible for bringing in the money that ultimately makes things happen. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge um, responsibility. Um, and sometimes it's really scary. And a lot of it is just about trusting, yeah, what we're doing is a good idea. What we're doing is necessary and will help people, but it could also shape a legal system. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in, yeah, in my journey, learning to trust myself, uh, interrogate my own ideas, where they come from, and not be afraid to take up space. And that's all Mount Holyoke. Yeah. Th those are really three great ideas <laughs> to share with this audience. And I'm just curious, I'm just going to ask, do we have seniors in the room? I'm imagining we do. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh. Fabulous. That's fabulous. Yeah. Well, so having said that, you know, I'm going to take you back a little <laughs> bit, right? So it's your senior year. And <laughs> <laughs> your senior year at Mount Holyoke. And as you said, you didn't go straight to law school or Rwanda. You yeah. started out in AmeriCorps in Ohio. Yeah. Tell us yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, graduating in 2009 um, was a really difficult time, right? Um, the economic recession. I was living in, I think, North Rocky at the time. And I can remember sitting in my dorm room, applying, 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 applying. Mm -hmm. And I really knew that I didn't want to go um, straight to grad school. That was because I was a little unclear as to what I wanted to do. I thought probably I would eventually go to some sort of grad school, but it wasn't clear enough yet in my mind. And I also had good advice from Professor Penny Gill. Don't go to law school unless you are certain because it's going to be very difficult. So I thought, OK, I'm going um, I'm going to work for a while and, and get out into the world and see things. And I knew I wanted to do service. right? Another thing that Mount Holyoke inspires in its students. Um, and I felt, OK, AmeriCorps is a good option. I can get some um, skills. Mm -hmm. I can give back to the US. And then during that year, I can set my sights on Rwanda and how to set that up. It also helped that my uh, best friend, who was also a Mount Holyoke grad, was also doing AmeriCorps. <laughs> um, but it turned out to be a brilliant thing. I had a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful boss, Marsha Jones, who I'm still in contact with, and you know another strong um, woman who's leading. Um, and yeah, she was really what I needed at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I got to Ohio. And then Rhonda. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I know that there are questions in the audience. I'm going <laughs> to pause here. 
and see what questions come forward. Because I, I can only imagine there are lots of questions. None from my parents, please. <laughs> <laughs> they can question me after. <laughs> yes? Um, as the soon-to-be AmeriCorps service member, what did your okay. service entail? So I was working at a community college in Ohio doing service learning. So it was a lot um, about creating service opportunities for students. Um, it helped me realize that I didn't want to go into education, which I didn't really think, but it was just a great opportunity at the right time out. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I did. I worked at a local community college. Yeah. Do you know what you're going to be doing? Uh, yes, I'll be in Boston with an organization that does um, yeah. in-school writing classes and out-of-school tutoring. Okay, that's wonderful. Is that city year? Um, no, uh, okay. eight to six. Boston. Okay, <laughs> cool. Very cool. Well, AmeriCorps is great. I hope you had a great experience. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I just had a comment. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's okay, Mom. Okay. You're allowed. <laughs> go ahead. Go for no it. No question. But, um, you know, we're so proud of Caitlin. Um, she says rule. But sometimes I don't think people really understand how rural she was. I mean, we have a town of 700 people, maybe. And it's in the middle of um, Pennsylvania, you know. And all three of our kids, they're just worldwide. And it's just amazing to us that Caitlin first came to Mount Holyoke and got the great education that she did but then to go on and do what she's done, you know? And like she said, I think Mount Holyoke really gave her the um, shot in the arm to pursue that, you know? And then like, she just had a heart for Africa when she graduated. And I went over to see her in Rwanda and it was just, I was just amazed at what she did coming from this little tiny town, uh, graduating class of what? 2009? 2009? No, I mean in, in Sullivan County. 2005. Yeah, but how many? How many students? Oh, how many students? I don't know, 30? Uh, 30. 30, <laughs> 30, 50 at the most. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's pretty amazing that she's done what she has. Yeah. And she wouldn't have done that without first coming here. Yeah. Thanks, Mom. There's a testimony. <laughs> My number one fan. Yes, <laughs> yes. That um, you have to have somewhat of an adventurous spirit to kind of go from rural Pennsylvania to ending up um, in Rwanda and Somaliland. But was that something that you felt you always had and was awakened here at Mount Holyoke, or was that something that you didn't hmm. even know that you had until you were here? I think maybe it's something I didn't know that I had, and I'm not. Sh I, I think it's also a question of whether I have that now. I think it would be maybe strong will. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think, um, again, coming to Mount Holyoke broadened my view, right, and, and really gave me a, a bigger picture of the issues in the world and what I could do about it. Um, and yeah, maybe it's a bit adventurous, but I, I think at the end of the day, yeah, it's you know, a lot of, a lot of, I think, being successful in life, just generally, is about persistence. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, yeah, the strong will mm -hmm. kind of, sometimes I just want to stay in one place and not go anywhere. <laughs> um, but it's been a, a really great experience. And yeah, thanks to Mount Holyoke, honestly. Yes. Yeah. Um. So one of the things I like most about Mount Holyoke is a diverse community we yeah. have. Like I just sit in the dining tiny table and I hear stories from like all over the world. So I was wondering if that was also part of the your Mount Holyoke experience that helped you like I'm just curious if you have any friend from Africa back then or just like anyone who who like any connections that yeah. um yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I you know, growing up in rural Pennsylvania there, I think there was one person of color and he was adopted. Um, so yeah, it was a really big eye-opening experience in a lot of ways. Um, and 
yeah, meeting people from all over the world, right? I think one thing that really impressed me when I came to campus is, you know, the markers in the middle of campus that say this, you know, Accra is this many kilometers away or uh -huh. Pretoria. And it's just, so yeah, it opens up your mind a lot. And, and I think helped me at that time maybe see things from other people's perspectives, right? Um, whether they're from urban America or whether they're from Accra, um, yeah, getting, getting to be in an intellectual environment um, with all sorts of people, but also a social environment. So yeah, it was really inspiring and I think encouraging. Yeah, it's... Well, and you mentioned, uh, actually, uh, you told me, and I don't remember if it came up in our conversation, that your first um, international experience was to Ghana. Yeah, yeah, that was my uh, summer of sophomore year. Um, yeah, that was my first time abroad, and yeah, by that time I had uh, studied, um, I think, taken a class with Holly Hansen in African studies, and I had my first year seminar, seminar was called Globalization and Its Discontents. So yeah, pretty quickly being at Mount Holyoke, I was looking outside of America, um, outside of the US, and yeah, there was just something about the African continent that I wanted to explore more. Um, and so yeah, got myself an opportunity to go to Accra and went there, and then it was also after Hurricane Katrina at that time, so my best friend was volunteering in New Orleans, so then I went down to New Orleans for a while and was with her. And so those were all really formative experiences. And again, and I'm not just saying this to sell Mount Holyoke <laughs> um, or can, you know, encourage you for being here, um, I'm not sure I would have done that without Mount Holyoke because it's, yeah, it's this international environment that you're talking about, but it's also an interesting environment where everybody's driven, right? Like, I think it was an interesting idea to go and do summer internships or, you mm -hmm. know, travel during that time and, or go and volunteer somewhere. Um, so that was also really formative for me and pushed me outside of my comfort zone because growing up, what I did in the summer was show horses. And that's what got me interested in Mount Holyoke, uh, the equestrian team, but then once I got here, things really started cha changing for me. Um, the world started opening up. <laughs> As it turns out, you didn't ride horses No, here. <laughs> I did for I mean, my gym bit. credit. Yeah. For my, <laughs> yeah, I did, <laughs> but um, yeah, I didn't end up being on the team. Um, and, you know, I think that's an interesting experience because that was really what um, I had been working towards. Mm -hmm. And I got here and I tried out for the team and I didn't make it. I made it my second time, but then I was like, wait, this isn't what I wanted. And so it was, you know, a time when I had to say, well, if horses are not my identity, um, what I'm about, what is, right? And again, that service-oriented mindset um, is what I picked up on. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, um, I know that you don't spend all your time in Somaliland. <laughs> so tell us about where you spend the rest of your time. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> uh, I split my time between Somaliland and Sweden. A little over a year ago, I met a wonderful man who was there working for the United Nations. He happens to be Swedish. I was looking for a place where I could split my time. Um, I was also looking forward to having a little bit more, you know, the coveted balance in life. I had been completely career focused until that point, which I'm happy for. Um, but I think at the end of the day, and one of my professors at Oxford said this, you know, life is short, but it's really wonderful to be doing all of these things, but there's other parts of life. Um, and so I'm lucky that he's really supportive of me not giving up my career. I don't want him to give up his career. So when I'm not in Somaliland, I'm in Sweden. So I just couldn't get enough of the snow when I was at Malaya. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to get more. <laughs> and well, we're delighted that your friend Joseph is here with us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so welcome to Mount Holyoke. And um, as you think about your role, uh, one of the things that there's a lot about your 
situation that seems unique. You know, I'm imagining most of the students sitting here are not going to join you in Somaliland, <laughs> but I don't want to close out that opportunity. <laughs> yeah. um, but they might be thinking about leading a not-for-profit organization. Yeah. They might be thinking about, you know, um, working for an NGO, any yeah. number of things. Um, you are the executive director, which means you are not that different from me. Yeah. Uh, as a president of a not-for-profit organization, yeah. known in this case as Mount Holyoke College, yeah. um, fundraising is an important part of what you do. Talk yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so fundraising, yes, is... You think at the end of the day, when you're trying to affect change in the world, um, positive change, you realize um, you need money to do that. Um, when I went to law school, I never thought I would end up fundraising. <laughs> um, but, you know, in 2020, when we founded the Children's Legal Defense Center, we had this great idea that we were really passionate and confident about, and we needed money behind that to make it viable, right? So we're providing free legal services, legal aid to our clients, because they can't afford lawyers, so we have to be able to fundraise to do that ourselves. And we started at super grassroots. I started a GoFundMe, right? We raised the initial seed money from GoFundMe, um, and then from that, we were able to hire a small team, get enough of a track record, and then um, now we're funded by UNICEF. Um, and we also raise donations in the US. And I think if I'm being honest, that's probably the part of my work now that pushes me out of my comfort zone the most. Mm -hmm. Right? I loved being at Mount Holyoke in the library. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, um, you know, still in my job, do a lot of writing. We're going to be doing a legal commentary on the juvenile justice law in Somaliland. And I put that in our budget specifically so I could write it and still do that thought work. But it's also really um, sometimes exciting, even though it's still challenging, to go out into the world and say, this is an issue. This is why you should care about it. And please support us. Um, which, yeah, it can be challenging, but also really rewarding. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a new set of skills I've had to learn. Um, and a lot of it is good writing, um, which you get here at Mount Holyoke. A lot of it is good speaking, which you get here at Mount Holyoke. And yeah, identifying an issue and trying to find a solution to it and getting other people behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's been an adventure, the fundraising part. You started in 2020. Yes. Which was certainly um, a pivotal year. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> uh, you know, COVID peaking in yeah. 2020. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, sort of a new organization in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, it was um, an adventure. Um, <laughs> so I think one thing... Um, you know, COVID really shook up a lot of the world, obviously, right? That's a straightforward, obviously, um, a, you know, changed things for a lot of people. And pre-COVID, I was at another um, local NGO in Somaliland, the Horizon Institute, and so was my colleague Idris. And a big thing, that was also a nonprofit, so it was donor funded, and it was funded by the UK government. And when COVID hit, their funding priorities changed, so our program stopped. And the leadership of that nonprofit decided to wrap up. But for us, for Idris and myself, we saw that as an opportunity. Um, we still had, at that time, we were taking on clients through a paralegal project. So we weren't um, providing them legal representation, but we were helping them navigate the criminal justice system. And yes, it was a pandemic, but they were still in prison. So we still saw, um, you know, the issue was still alive even though things in the world were changing. So I, at the beginning of the pandemic, was in Somaliland, and then I went home to Pennsylvania to my parents. Um, but Idris and I kept in touch, and then in November 2020, we said, we're gonna do this. Um, and so I was in my childhood bedroom, uh, <laughs> furiously fundraising, furiously putting strategies together. Idris was in the courtroom, trying to get cases, trying to get 
um, energy behind it, and we just did it. Um, we came up with an initial six-month plan. Um, we self-funded it for six months and said, okay, for six months we're willing to put this money behind it. Um, you know, we will try to raise money during the six months. We'll try to do this during the six months. And it just kind of snowballed. Um, you know, there weren't many uh, restrictions in Somaliland at that time. So he could move around, he could go to court. Um, and it, you know, our instincts were right. It was a real need. There's not a lot of legal services in Somaliland and there's not a lot of professionalized lawyers. So people are really looking for good lawyers, um, especially parents of children who are in prison. That's mm -hmm. a really critical time if you're in that situation. And so, um, yeah, we had endless clients. We still do. Um, we have parents knocking at our door all the time asking for legal aid. Um, and so, yeah, it was a tough time to do it, but it was, um, I think sometimes when an issue arises and you have an idea that'll work and you, then you have people who support you, it just kind of moves forward. Mm -hmm. So, but there were a lot of challenges. It was challenging then to travel back to Somaliland during the pandemic mm -hmm. um, and all of that entailed, um, you know, getting tests, getting into Somaliland was a bit tricky. Um, but yeah, we just pushed through. I think at that point, nothing was going to stop us. <laughs> <laughs> we were feeling very passionate. So. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Um, you explained to me a little bit earlier when we were backstage, so yeah. to speak, um, about why there are so many young people in prison yeah. in Somaliland. Yeah. I think it might be helpful to this audience to know a little bit more about, you know, yeah. why would a 12-year-old be in yeah. jail? Yeah. So in... So Somaliland, right, it's part of Somalia, which is one of the least developed areas of the world. Um, so at the end of the day, there's not a lot of opportunity. Um, there's a lot of for-profit universities that are pumping out people with degrees, not a lot of skills. Um, there's no very limited jobs to speak of. Um, so there is a large part of the society, mainly teenage boys, who don't have much to do, right? Teenage girls are very busy. It's a very traditional society. They are at home, <laughs> cleaning, cooking, helping take care of the kids. Um, but teenage boys don't really have much to do and they end up on the streets, especially in the capital of Hergesa, in groups, um, looking for something to do. And one of the main offenses that we defend is mobile phone theft. So they will go up to someone, steal their phone. Um, and in Somaliland, like in the US, they're taking a very tough on crime approach. Well, the way that we deal with these boys who are stealing phones is to put them in prison. And to go to prison in Somaliland, there is no juvenile system, separate system to speak of. You're with adults in a concrete cell, right? Um, no education, very limited nutritious food. Um, so it's, it's a lot of social factors that drive it, right? So President Tatum mentioned a 12-year-old being in prison. So in Somaliland, the law is pretty good. You have to be 15 before you can be prosecuted by the criminal justice system, but there's no documentation of age. So someone who is arrested may say he's 12, but the police officer, the arresting police officer will say, no, you're 15 and you're of age to prosecute. And we as defense lawyers have very little um, evidence to prove otherwise, other than the parents coming in, you know, they use the Quran in Somaliland, swearing on the Quran that this is my child's age. But it's, um, no, there's no records kept systematically. So it's hard to, um, to prove that, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of social factors uh, pushing it. There, they, as I mentioned before, had a very brutal civil war in the late 80s, early 90s, and it, de it decimated Somaliland, including the education system, right? So maybe you're in school, but the education is not very good, right? So a lot of our clients were in school and then dropped out because either their parents can't afford the fees or the school doesn't feel worthwhile. Um, you know, another issue is you know, you've all heard, I'm sure, of migrants from Africa trying to make it to Europe, going
going th up through Sudan and into Libya, a lot of them are Somalis. Um, and it all comes down to not feeling hope, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're so lucky we're here at Mount Holyoke. It's this wonderful place in the world where we can feel safe, we can explore intellectually, we can explore, you know, question our own assumptions and think about how we're going to impact the world and, you know, future is generally bright. Um, we have an opportunity, even if it might not be the opportunity we really, really want. Um, at least it's an opportunity and in Somaliland they don't have that mm -hmm. necessarily, um, or they do for a small amount of people. So a lot of our clients are teenage boys, mainly 17, um, who don't have um, engagement in life that they need. Mm -hmm. um, and so then they end up in the criminal justice system. So a lot of social factors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, I have two questions. One is about whether you have kept track of um, uh, folks that you've had helped to, to earn their release. Um, but another is um, maybe with just a little bit of background. So um, one of the things that I really enjoyed learning recently is that a Mount Holyoke alum, um, Catherine Higgs Milton, class of 1964, is the founder of AmeriCorps. Oh, wow. And yes. That, um, when I, when I <laughs> there you go. Why didn't they tell me that? <laughs> <laughs> when I met her um, uh, just a couple of months ago uh, on the West Coast, she mentioned to me that um, Mary Lyon was her inspiration. Um, for the concept of service learning, mm -hmm. and that she really brought, you know, Mount Holyoke and Mary Lyon as, as inspiration um, in, into that. And I heard you say, you know, that you got this inspiration and you always come back to Mary Lyon, and I, and I really uh, appreciate that, especially since tomorrow I'll be giving you the mm -hmm. Mary Lyon Award. Um, and I wonder um, what the Mary Lyon Award means to you. Okay. Great question. Great question. So let me answer the first one about whether we track our clients. Um, not formally. There are some clients that we go back and visit, um, but kind of once we get a result in a case, um, we have to move on to the next case because there's, there's so many people who need a lawyer in Somaliland. Um, but I think probably your question is asking, how do they do once they're released? Mm -hmm. So we have a very small rate of recidivism. So we do track um, kids who get back in the system and who we have represented twice, three times. Um, and that is less than 5% of our clients. Mm -hmm. But the, the kids who do well are the kids who have good parents and good family who want to see them do well. Um, unfortunately, a small amount of our clients are street children. So in Somaliland, you can be considered an orphan if you don't have a father. If you have a mother, well, hopefully she'll help you. But you might, um, you know, live on, just because of the traditional society, um, you would be considered an orphan in that situation and may not have a home and be housed, or you, um, quite a few of our clients. So Somaliland is on the border with Ethiopia and children from Ethiopia come to Somaliland looking um, to be domestic servants as, as awful as that sounds. And they can end up in the criminal justice system and they too are unhoused, right? They're just children coming from Ethiopia by themselves um, and living on the street. And so those are the clients that you can get them released, but you don't have the bigger answer. Mm -hmm. There is no system of social services. Um, UNICEF has done what they can to try to promote the government to have some basic social services. Um, there is a house for children who are on the street, but it's temporary and limited. And so the kids that we have kept in contact with and gone to visit and checked in on that are doing well, they have um, parents. And they are aunts and uncles who are actively trying to keep the children engaged mm -hmm. while pushing them to go to school um, or pushing them to go to a, learn a trade. Um, so a lot of it, especially in the Somali context, is about your family unit. So if you have a f strong family unit, you have 
um, more hope. But if you're one of the few children who doesn't have that, there's no government system, social system to catch you. Um, so it can be really hard because you also in this work learn your limits mm -hmm. of the impact that you can have. Right? We can do some really good defense lawyering and we can really win some good cases, but we can't change the whole problem. Um, so sometimes it can be really humbling. Um, and sometimes, yeah, there, you just, there are some kids who you can release and you're not sure what's going to happen to them. So it can be a bit um, uplifting, but also challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and so to your second question, what does it mean um, to get the Mary Lyon Award? Uh, it's really, it's really, yeah, it feels really important. It feels really m motivating. Um, I got an email from someone at the Alumni Association and it wasn't quite clear and she's like, I really need to talk to you. And I'm like, oh gosh, why? Uh, <laughs> what, what are you going to ask? Um, um, and it was, yeah, really touching. Mm -hmm. um, when I came here with my dad, who is with me today, when we were coming for accepted students, um, he tells this story a lot that we were sitting in the green by Mary Lyon's grave talking about why I wanted to come to Mount Holyoke. And I told him, it just feels inspiring. I've never been to a place like this. And, you know, then we talked about how we would financially make that happen. Um, and lucky for me, I have a really supportive uh, father who made it happen for me. And so from the very beginning, she's been a figure um, for me here. And yeah, you know, such an articulate woman and such a brave woman. And, you know, the quote of, you know, that she implored students to go where no one else will go, do what no one else will do. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm far away from my family. I'm in a culture that is drastically diver like different from my own, where I often feel uncomfortable and sometimes I feel unsafe. You know, what, what am I doing? Or, um, but then I think it's that moment to reflect on Mary Lyon and think about, wow, what she did yes. at that time and how it radically changed education for women in America and then the world, right? Like it's, so it gives a lot of perspective mm -hmm. and to um, be invited back and given an award in her name is something I really treasure and something that I will use as motivation <laughs> in the times when I'm feeling the most discouraged. So I'm really grateful. Well, it's a delight that you um, ha are here and able to share your reflections as it relates to that. Um, with this audience. I am wondering if we have time maybe for a couple more questions. So I, sure. I want to give our uh, students that opportunity. Yes. Thanks. Um, when you talked about how you were kind of not as confident in some of like your, what, when you would speak and maybe your academics when you first started at Mount Holyoke, that you mm. mentioned how like the environment here really like allowed you to grow and become like a more confident person. Yeah. Um, that was, that I like really identify with that sentiment. Um, I'm a senior and I feel like my time at Mount Holyoke has been really important in like helping me become someone who feels like I can go into a room and like make my case and, yeah. you know, be successful. Um, but I think something that I guess I'm apprehensive about mm. with leaving Mount Holyoke is part of why I feel like I have that sense of confidence is because like this is such a nurturing environment and I feel like there's a sense that like everyone here wants everyone to succeed mm. um, and in the real world it's not always like that mm. so I'm wondering I guess like what kind of advice do you have or like how do you um, remain confident, um, kind of persevere, remain persistent, even when you find yourself in settings that aren't 
as conducive to that as mm. Mount Holyoke is. Mm. Mm. That is that is a really um, I think important question because. Yeah, I think we're in a very unique environment here that is encouraging and saying, yeah, do it, do it, get out there, get out there. And a lot of times when you're out there, people will say, that's not possible. Mm, you can't do that, do this or do that. Or, um, And I think for me, um, what has been really... Um, important to maintaining my confidence or maintaining my persistence is um, having a really good support network. My parents have been woken up in the middle of the night to all sorts of phone calls for me, <laughs> um, but also my uh, support network from Mount Holyoke. My best friend for life met here at Mount Holyoke. I'll never forget how we met. We were in a small group session at orientation, and she said growing up, she showed goats at 4-H, and I showed horses, and I was like, this is going to be my friend. <laughs> and then we were in Gender Studies 101 with Mary Renda, and the rest is history. Um, but that relationship has also been really pivotal for me. When I was deciding to set up the Children's Legal Defense Center, I spent hours on the phone with Sarah. Um, and her giving me that Mount Holyoke, you can do this if you want to, um, is really, really important. And so I think not being afraid to lean on the people around me <coughs> is so critical because, yeah, the, it can be a very intimidating world. Um, but another thing as I get further in my career that I'm learning is, yeah, this is an amazing environment but someone is creating this environment for us, right? It's, you know, people think, how do I make change? How do I do all of this in the world? Well, it's humans who are creating all of this, so you can create it. And one thing that I really try to do as a leader is create that environment for my team. Um, so, you know, Somaliland, again, is a traditional environment. Usually you listen to the boss, that's it. Um, and one thing that I've really tried to do in my position is nurture an environment where, yeah, they can come back and question, is this really what we should be doing on this case? Or put their own ideas forward. So I think, you know, if I was in your position and getting ready to, you know, graduate, I would want someone to tell me, you know, remember that you have this great network with you wherever you go, right? I'm sure that you have formed friendships here, um, either with you know, your friends around you or you know, um, academic connections with your professors, that will always be there, even if you're not here on campus. Um, you know, Mountain Day is still a special day for me every year <laughs> um, and a time to reconnect with my colleagues. But I think it's also remembering you have the power to create that space for yourself and for others, um, which I think is really, really important um, when you're thinking about going into your career. Yeah, great. Anyone else? Yes. I'm already a big fan of your work in <laughs> Somaliland. And um, uh, I, once again, I'm also a senior, and um, I also feel very protected by the environment that I'm currently in right now. And I feel like this four years has been a lot to me. It mm. means a lot, definitely. Mm. But then again, uh, we're, we're just like in this protected environment and um, while we feel safe around here, the outside world might not be the same. And so I was wondering, um, since you mentioned that sometimes your work can be very dangerous sometimes, um, or like relatively so, yeah. and so I was wondering if you can share some experiences that you have that might put you in danger and what's yeah. your solution? Yeah. Um, so in Somaliland, in particular, um, it can be an unstable political environment. Um, currently in part of the country, there's an ongoing conflict, armed conflict. Um, you know, it's also, um, 
you know, a Muslim majority country where uh, there's a lot of sentiments of not liking what they consider Westerners, right? So what I represent as a white American woman. Um, so we're going into prisons in Somaliland, right? Uh, a lot of times we're in the yard with the prisoners, and so there's a lot of people around me who are interested in needing help, which can um, create some challenging situations. And kind of like my previous question, the most important thing to mitigate that is relationships. Um, so, you know, when I'm on the ground, knowing, of course, the security situation that is there, um, but also, you know, having a very close working relationship with my colleagues, other people in my environment that I can turn to and ask for help. But at the end of the day, it's also trusting yourself. Right, like your gut will tell you if it's not a good situation um, to be in and if you need to leave. Um, so, but at the end of the day, it's, it's always been my friends who have been my greatest support and um, friends I met here at Mount Holyoke, but also in Somaliland. Yeah. We didn't have a question from this side of the room. I just want to say, so I want to give this side of the room an opportunity. Yeah. We had one at the beginning. Oh, well, I can okay. Yeah. Um, so at the beginning of the talk, you talked about how graduating from Mount Holyoke, you thought you might want to go to grad school, but you weren't sure exactly what way you were headed yet. Yeah. Um, so do you have advice for people who are maybe on the brink of sort of like an unknown path, like yeah. general interests and ideas, but not exactly sure where they're headed after graduation? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think my basic advice for anyone who's graduating is um, not be afraid to get things wrong um, and change course, right? It can feel when you're graduating that you need this like solid plan and it has to be a really ambitious plan and a really impressive plan and I'm gonna go get my PhD and I'm gonna do all these things and it doesn't necessarily have to be that. I think um, I put a lot of pressure, that type of pressure on myself. Um, but the most interesting experiences I've had and the most transformative are the ones where um, I didn't follow what everyone else expected of me. And I followed my own desires, what I wanted, right? When I was graduating law school, the law school did not necessarily want me to run off to Somaliland. Mm. They wanted me to stay and do a clerkship, and that would have been a bit more prestigious in their eyes, and would have put the law school in better light. Mm. Um, but that's not what I wanted. So, but I didn't necessarily know what I wanted um, until I tried things, right? I think with grad school, in particular, if someone's thinking of going to law school, it's a really big commitment financially, but also a personal commitment. So if you can give yourself time to maybe experience something different that will inform that, then all the better. Um, you know, I had a great time in AmeriCorps. I learned a lot, um, you know, about our own issues in America, right? about inequality here and how do we address that uh, through education and, you know, going from Mount Holyoke, such an elite prestigious school to working in a community college. How, how do we create an environment where everyone gets a uh, quality education? Um, I don't regret doing that. And then, you know, going to Rwanda, it gave me a much broader understanding of where the law can fit into the world when I went into law school. If I had gone straight from graduation here to law school, uh, while that's not necessarily a bad thing, and I know people who have done that, I wouldn't have had that life experience that would have just then informed why I was doing the graduate work and what I wanted to use it for um, in the type of graduate work. If I had listened to my dad, I probably would have decided on law school a long time ago, <laughs> a lot sooner. 
Um, but I had to get there myself. And I think it's okay to give yourself the time to do that, even though there's a lot of pressure um, to the contrary. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and good luck. Yeah. Well, with that, I think we need to bring this conversation to a close. But the good news is we are all going to have an opportunity to have some food and uh, refreshments together and lots of time for one-on-one -on -one conversations, I'm Wonderful. sure. So thank you. Please yeah. join me in thanking <laughs> Caitlin. Uh, thank you. And congratulations again on your mm. Mary Lyon Award. Oh, thank you. Thank yes. you so much. It really means a lot. Mm. And thanks for inviting me here today. It's, um, it's been our, our pleasure. Yeah. So thank you all for being here and your great questions. And please feel free to linger and join us for dinner and uh, spend some time. Yeah. And maybe even take a selfie or two. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Caitlin. Yeah. We yeah. didn't have iPhones when I was here, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> or at least I didn't have one then. Yes. But, yeah. Happy to talk more, too. Fabulous.